Hey there, listener. Do you ever feel isolated at work or with family because you're different? Do strangers see you as unwholesome or possibly even evil? We understand, because like you, we've experienced the pain of being judged, simply because we're women who love horror movies. Since 2014, the Bloodlust podcast has been discussing every type of horror movie, from big-budget Blumhouse releases to foreign art house cannibal movies. The three women of the Bloodlust watch them all and tell you which ones you shouldn't miss. We even have a guy on hand in case we have questions like, could a 115-pound woman really load a crossbow? Or, how long would it take to vertically bisect a person? Both actual questions asked on the show, by the way. So let the Bloodlust be your go-to podcast for classy broads and a token dude talking horror. We see you out there, ladies. Let's get weird together. That's the Bloodlust. On iTunes. And everywhere else. Hey everyone, Chad Cemetery is back, as is Jonathan Watkins. Today we are talking about Sometimes They Come Back, four more, and it is the third of the Sometimes They Come Back movies, which hopefully nobody wants to start, hopefully nobody wants to start bringing these back again, like they have with Children <laughs> of the Corn numerous times. But Jonathan, thank you first off for agreeing to do this one because i know <laughs> yeah i know thank you for having me on of course i know we talked about the previous movie and it's one of those things where i know that a lot of these tv kind of movies direct to video ones whatever their mm -hmm. situation is a lot of them weren't very good so it makes me very happy that there are other stephen king nerds out there who at least are aware that these movies exist and want to talk about them with me <laughs> Yeah, no, I find like, I think I said this on the last time we did these, I find these, I find these movies fascinating. I don't usually find them very good, but I do, I do find them quite fascinating, especially these that turned into these long franchises. I mean, I guess this one stopped here, but, um, but yeah, and sometimes you get to find like an interesting, like writer or director, not in this case, but, uh, sometimes you get to find like somebody, uh, that worked on one of these that, you know, became something else afterwards. So it's. I don't know. They're very it, not late nineties direct to video was a very interesting time. Oh, absolutely. And I think one of the things is, you know, the cast is always so interesting for things like this because you never know who is going to pop up. And, you know, in the last one, Hillary Swank was in it when she was super young, but in this one, mm -hmm. you have Faith Ford, who is mostly known for her TV appearances. You have Clayton Rohner. Max Perlick, who was in Ferris Bueller's Day Off. That was one of the first things yeah, he was in, yeah. aside from a short video. And you kind of look at the cast for these movies, and you're yeah. like, oh, this was kind of an odd choice for some of them. Yeah. Ch now, Chase Masterson is in it, and she I don't know that she's really well-known now, although she does do a Star Trek podcast now, but um, she was on uh, Star Trek Deep Space Nine around this time yeah. and was doing like a lot of these direct-to-video like sci-fi movies and stuff. So she might have been the one that fit. But yeah, Faith Ford, I mean, she was on Murphy Brown. And <laughs> um, I actually met her. I had a friend in college that ended up working on Murphy Brown, and uh, I was out there visiting him, and uh, I got to come on set, and uh, I actually got to meet her, and she was super cool at least you know when i met her she was i assume she is in general but it was really funny seeing her in this because i don't think i've seen her in anything other than uh comedies sitcoms yeah because then she went on to have her own comedy or co-comedy if you will with hope and faith and that's yep. what i think i had recognized her from i don't think i really watched the show a lot but I was mm -hmm. watching some other comedies around that time that I think, you know, I probably just kept seeing the commercials over and over and over again for it. Mm -hmm. So yeah. I wasn't super familiar with anyone's work in this, really. And I have seen Ferris Bueller's Day Off, but you have this cast that seems pretty off, given the subject matter. And I would say of the three <laughs> Sometimes They Come Back movies, this one strays the most from the source material, because usually it's people coming back from the past and they have some sort of connection to the people who are being terrorized, yeah. basically. And in this one, they kind of flipped it. And the story was just super weird because 
one of the guys who goes to, you know, Antarctica <laughs> to basically, I guess, conduct. This is a ripoff of the thing, <laughs> pretty much. Well, not a ripoff, but it's very, uh, I think whoever made this had seen John Carpenter's The Thing. Probably. <laughs> <laughs> But you have this sort of rescue mission going on and yeah. you're under the impression that the main goal is to get out of there and that these two people who came, the military police people who came, have nothing to do with anyone who's there. And then you go on to find out that the captain is a demon and his demon brother is... <laughs> <laughs> in the mines or whatever. You're talking about Clayton Roner's character, yeah. right? That's your, that is that okay. It's just so bizarre. <laughs> yeah. Not only a demon, but I got the impression, although they don't, I mean, they're not subtle about it, but they don't flat out say we're the sons of Satan. But I got that was what you were. Satan had sex with a, with a human or two humans, I guess, because they were half brothers, right? <laughs> yeah, they were half brothers. That was the that was the impression I got that we were supposed to take out of it. It almost felt like the movie felt too silly. It almost felt like the movie felt that would be too silly to say, but but at that point, I don't think anything I don't think anything that movie could have done would have made it any goofier. I had a couple of interesting theories about this movie, but like I couldn't find very much of anything on it as far as like the making of it. I don't know if if you looked into it, but did you watch it on Vudu? Yes. Okay, so when you watched it, it was called Frozen, right? When you got it off Vudu, it was called Sometimes They Come Back for More. But like when you're actually watching the movie, like in the opening credits, it's called Frozen. I honestly didn't catch on to that because I was so distracted by the cuts. <laughs> <laughs> that they had in the opening because it was cutting yeah. to snow, cutting back to credits, yeah. cutting to snow. Oh my goodness, all of a sudden there's blood in the snow. And it was just so dramatic in the cuts. Yeah. And you could tell that they were trying to make it this tense moment to open the movie. And you're just like, yeah, yeah that didn't work. Yeah, because I was wondering when I saw it was called Frozen in the, in the, in the, the title screen, I was like, man, I wonder if this was like originally something else and then they just made it or, but then what I found, the only thing I could find was there was a blogger that reviewed it in 2012. Um, and they said when they rented it, it was sometimes they come back for more, but the title screen said Frozen. So my guess is that's around the time that like Frozen came out, the Disney movie. And then there was the Adam Green horror movie. So I'm kind of curious. I, I have a feeling they just threw that title on there, hoping they would uh, they would trick some people into uh, renting it instead of the the Frozen movie they actually wanted to see. So I guess there wasn't much there. But this felt like this felt like they they just bought a spec script about the devil in Antarctica and then just made it. Sometimes they come back for more. That's what it felt like to me. But I couldn't find anything to back that up. There's so little information on this. Yeah. If you check the Stephen King wiki or Wikipedia, it's just like they give you the plot. They give you the cast. Half of the cast doesn't even have like clickable links to yeah. go through and see what else <laughs> they had been in. And it's just so obvious that they were like, OK, we're going to throw in some people who would be recognizable for the time. And yeah. we're just going to run with this and make it based on a Stephen King story, which it did say in the opening credits. I did notice it said, like, based on Stephen King, sometimes they come back or. Yeah. So they definitely the frozen thing came later. Yeah. Like, I, like I said, I, I'm almost positive since it was around 2012. That must have been they were just retitling it, trying to get a few more bucks out of it. For the people that might accidentally, they'll just see, oh, hey, Frozen. I've wanted to watch that Frozen movie. And then, you know, they get the wrong thing. <laughs> I imagine they would turn it off pretty quickly, I, yeah, probably, though, because probably. most adults will be watching Frozen with children. <laughs> <laughs> Very true. But yeah, no, this was this was interesting. It, but it's also one of those movies, like for me, like it's it's almost kind of worse. Like, it, like, it's not like so bad. It's good or anything. It's just it's just it's pretty bland. Like, it's just. It's pretty run of the mill. It's pretty straightforward. And like, I don't know, it's just kind of a generic horror thriller with a snow setting, which can be interesting, but they didn't really use it in any interesting way here. But um, I didn't think it was terrible, but I just I thought it was pretty it's probably pretty forgettable. I will say that of the three, I have liked each one less and less. <laughs> I think this probably was worse than the last. I mean, the last one was basically just a carbon copy of the first one. But mm -hmm. yeah, I guess at least it still had like the Alexis Arquette 
the performance was interesting and uh there was some stuff and then like you said hillary swank and uh there was some interesting things there at least but yeah no this this is this was definitely the worst of the three i agree <laughs> it felt like it couldn't decide if it was a demon movie or a zombie movie yeah which i think hurt it because you have this frigid weather i think at one point they mentioned that it's 70 below outside and you're just like that is insane but fitting mm -hmm. for antarctica and you have these dead bodies that are coming back to life and because they're kind of frozen over and they're thawing out as they get inside mm -hmm. to go after the people who are inside they look way more like zombies than they ever do demons until you get yeah. to the end and they find like the i don't even know what to call it it's just the room with the big fire underneath all of the mines and you see that the captain and his half brother their eyes change in that scene and you're like okay we're understanding that these are the demon people now, even though the entire time before that, you kind of just get a sense that it's the undead attacking them. Yeah, well, and they were building, uh, I mean, this is like, apparently, I did find out this is loosely based on a, on a real thing in Greenland. Uh, what was it? It was called the Greenland Ice, it was the, uh, it was Project Ice Worm. Uh, during the Cold War in the 80s, the U.S. was, had a plan to build nuclear missile launch sites under the Greenland Ice Sheet. That sounds fun. Yeah. <laughs> so supposedly that's what this was kind of loosely based on. Um, so, I mean, I think that was what that, but I think that underground, I mean, that was the mines because I was having a hard time even figuring out where they were half the time because they would make, this movie is shot really poorly, but like Faith Ford would say, hey, it's 70 below out there. And then he'd be like, okay. But then like, but then they would go outside like 10 minutes later and you know, nothing happened and they would go to those, uh, those mine tunnels or whatever yeah. they were. It was just, it was very confusing. And then granted, you do find out that, you know, Clayton Roner's character is a demon, uh, the son of the devil, I guess. So maybe the cold doesn't really affect him, but you know, we didn't know that at the time. And, and then I guess the Max Perlet character ends up being a demon too. That was confusing to me because wouldn't he know that, Clayton Roner was a demon, but he didn't seem to like that. That whole thing confused me as well. And there, and there might've been something I missed, but um, I don't think so. <laughs> yeah. I was wondering if maybe the half brother somehow snuck in yeah. and turned him into a demon, but we don't see that. Oh, well, see, that's a possibility as well. Yes. And it's just like, I don't understand how you jump to some of these moments and you're just like, Oh, okay. The dude who was trying to fix the radio and whining about wanting out of there the whole time was a demon. That kind of makes no sense. You would think he would want to stay. And yeah. I think something happened along the way that we didn't see. And they're just yeah. like, oh, well, <laughs> whatever. We're going to continue. And then my, uh, I think my favorite part, though, was the sudden uh, romance between um, Clayton Roner and Faith Ford Yeah, that came out of, out of nowhere. Just, she was, I don't even remember how it happened with they kissed. She was like, he was telling her his story. And that's when she was just like, oh, the, I mean, he's telling, like, I'm the son of the devil. And my half brother's trying to kill us. And he killed your friends. And, and then, and then she, you know, just was like, oh, I'm going to jump your bones now. Cause that makes sense in this, in this moment. But uh, I don't know. The, the whole movie was very weird. And then he's <laughs> handing her an engagement ring that he gave someone who yes. is dead. <laughs> and it's just like, uh... Yes, and he took it He took it off the corpse, right? Like, because she was there. No, 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 no. He was... Never mind. I'm sorry. I'm getting my stuff confused. He, that was a flashback. Yeah. Which the flashbacks, like, that's when I thought, okay, this is where we're going to see, like... Because in the other two, it was like something happened in the past. And then years later, that person was affected by whatever they witnessed or whatever they did. Uh, that's what happened in the first two movies. And then, so I thought that's what we were going to see here, but that wasn't it. It was just, they were just showing how the two half-brothers, something they did in their past. But but nothing was coming back to haunt them. Yeah. So, you know, they weren't, I mean, because they're demons. I mean, they weren't affected by anything. He just held a grudge against his half-brother for, I guess, killing the woman he fell in love with years before that. But yeah, no, this doesn't tie into the... 
that sometimes they come back uh, storyline at all. The only thing I could think of is maybe they were just going to use this title. Like if this did well, maybe they were going to do kind of like an anthology type series. And like, you know, maybe future installments would just be different stories based around like revenge or something. But I, I don't know. I mean, I, I you know, like I said, you couldn't find really any information. Those are just theories that I had. Most likely it was probably just it was a property they had made money off of and they decided to make another one. So, <laughs> yeah, all I did manage to find was that it was written by a guy named Adam Grossman, who was. Mm -hmm in a band called Screw or something. And it's like, <laughs> this really felt like there weren't any seasoned film people involved in it other than mm -hmm. some of the cast members. And behind the scenes, you can only wonder what goes on because these aren't the kinds of Stephen King adaptations that people are clamoring for more information on. You know, it's not Kubrick's The Shining. It's not even the It miniseries, you know, these things that are so beloved by King fans are going to get more attention than these direct-to-video yeah. 90s <laughs> things that are going on. And I know there's some stuff in the 2000s as well coming up that isn't going to be so great, but it just hit such a stretch where they were like, let's make everything we can. And they pick the wrong things to make into mm -hmm. these franchises. You have Children of the Corn, you have these movies, you have three Mangler movies, I want to say. Yeah, I can't even imagine what those sequels are. <laughs> yeah. I've never seen those. I've seen the Mangler, but I haven't seen the Mangler since the theater. So you, I, get, I assume you've reviewed the Mangler on the podcast, right? Yeah, I covered that one semi-recently, and I have yet to watch the sequels. I know they are coming up, though, but... It's just something where I'm like, okay, I'm going to do these. I'm going to try to make the most out of it and have fun talking about them like yeah. I've been doing with these ones. And then hopefully things will start to get better. But then you even have like the Carrie sequels and remakes. And yeah. I don't know why there needs to be like four Carrie movies because the first one was so good. <laughs> I'm going to tell you, if you, have you seen the Rage Carry 2 yet? Because that's, I guess that came out a year after this. It, it's coming up, so I have not watched it just yet. I don't, I haven't seen it in a while. I remember that one being surprisingly decent, I will, I will say. So I, you don't think you have to, but that one actually has like a budget behind it. It was released in the theater. Yeah. So I will say though, this one is still the weirdest to me because I'm, a, well, I haven't seen the Mangler sequels, but I'm going to assume that both of those involve uh, the machine or the demon. All the Children of the Corn movies at least involve like children and 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 I guess corn, yeah. <laughs> uh, you know, something along those lines. But like, but like this, like you said, this is just I, this is like in no way other than it's called. Sometimes they come back again. I mean, there's nothing about this that that harks back, like makes you think of that story, which honestly isn't even like one of his better short stories either. I'm kind of impressed the first movie was because like I've recently read Night Shift and there's I mean, there's stories in Night Shift that have never been adapted that are that are way better than that one, you know, and so I don't know, it's just it's weird. And then you got three movies out of it. It's just it's crazy. Yeah. And it's not even that, you know, the Children of the Corn story was bad. It's just why do we need yeah. 10 of these? Same with the Mangler. It's like King always has these interesting concepts and things going on in his short stories, but mm -hmm. not all of them necessarily grab me. So I find it really interesting when the ones that don't grab me as much as some others get so much attention with adaptations. Yeah. Well, that's like there's a Jerusalem's Lot uh, miniseries that's being worked. I, I don't know with this COVID-19 stuff. I don't know. I don't know what's being worked on and what's not at this point or if it was already finished, but I know it was in the process um, and that's a story. That's a night shift. Also, that's a story that is 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 always is kind of boring, in my opinion. Yeah. But I'm fascinated by the fact that somebody's making like a ten episode series about it. Like, I'm totally gonna watch that because I'm just like, how are you making? How are you getting ten hours out of this story? You know. Especially since the book's been adapted twice already. Oh, well, Salem's Lot. I'm, but it's uh, it's Jerusalem's Lot. It's no, no, no. I know, but it's just kind of a tack on to the book and Absolutely. it's like okay well no, you've it, already done the book twice so how are you going to yeah. get another 10 hours out of this town <laughs> yeah and they're remaking salem's law too i mean that that got announced 
a few months ago, I guess, that somebody was writing. It's it's crazy. Yeah. Yeah, you're right. No, I'm sorry. I apologize. You are correct. You, I, I, I didn't get where you were going. But um, technically, yeah, yeah, they it's... did three adaptations if you want to count a return to Salem's Lot. But I tried to oh. forget about that one. <laughs> My God. Yeah, I forgot about that, too. That was Larry Cohen. Yeah, that's a that's a weird, weird movie. <laughs> Um. Yeah. So yeah. Sometimes they come back again uh, for more. This one's I mean, for, for more. more. Oh my god. <laughs> Same thing. Hey, it also looks like Adam Grossman. He actually directed. Sometimes they come back again. So that I guess he actually had a tie. Okay. Into these, I just happened to click on his name when you mentioned him. So because that name sounded familiar to me. And then, oh, that's weird. Hold on a second. Okay, so now it's saying that he also has a TV movie from 1998 called Frozen. What is going on? And it's, it's, yeah, it's sometimes they come back for more. So it actually has two different listings on IMDb as well. That's weird. <laughs> that is so confusing. It's like, uh, okay, what were you guys thinking? Are we going somewhere <laughs> with this? You know, what's kind of going on here? That's why it makes me think it was probably not going to be sometimes they come back for more. It was going to be something else. And then they just decided to tie it into the property, you know, at the last second. That, that's, that's, that's what it, that's what I guess. But like I said, you can't find anything on it. And it's really weird in today's, because I mean, people cover the, I mean, I mean, you're covering this movie, yeah. I mean, you know, I mean, podcasts and blogs and websites cover all kinds of movies. So it's, it's really odd when you can't find information uh, nowadays, which is also kind of funny because I think back to like the eighties and nineties, like when I had to like, I had to get all my information from like encyclopedias and stuff. So. Yeah, and I have the Creep Shows book, and I actually forgot to look this one up, but I'm sure it would be one of the entries that's like one page. Yeah, the Stephen King movie guy. Yeah, or is that? Yeah, I have that as well. Good call. <laughs> yeah, it was just one of those things. I was like, you know, they probably still don't have a lot to say about this movie, so I kind of just skipped it. I tend to look at it when I'm working on some of the bigger miniseries or something like that kind of like when the shining miniseries came around i was like okay let me dive into this a little more because one yeah. it's mick garris so i know there's going to be more information on oh yeah on it out there because he's done so many king adaptations and this one i was just like honestly i don't care it was so weird the <laughs> demon reveal takes so so long and then the guy's just like oh yeah i'm a demon carry on <laughs> Yeah, yeah. I, I will say, I mean, it, you know, there's no reason to watch this movie, but unless you're just a completist, but I mean, it, you know, it is short. It feels short. Like yeah. it does, I don't think it, I don't think it outstays its welcome or anything, but, um, uh, you know, and like I said, it's, I mean, it, it's not terrible. Like it, like I think I gave it like two stars on Letterboxd. Like it's not, it's not terrible. Like it's not, you know, it's not one star territory, but, but it's just so bland. Like it's just nothing. Just it just never really gets going in any kind of interesting direction. It's basically just they they tied together, uh, you know, like John Carpenter's The Thing, and they threw a love story in there, and uh, you know they threw like the demon, the devil in there or whatever, you know, because I guess that's what they're trying to do, right? They're trying to they're trying to raise the devil, correct? I mean, that's what we're supposed. To, they never say the devil, but. I mean, I, I don't know who else they would be trying to raise at the end and who they keep calling father. That's what it felt like, because it was like they needed a sacrifice. But it's like, you killed all these other people. You can't just use one of them. <laughs> yeah, the ones they were using as like zombies. Yeah, yeah, that, yeah it, was, it was so bizarre. But yeah, I, thought, I just thought that was really weird that they would never just say devil. Like, they just wouldn't say it. And I'm just like, w w at this point, what does it matter? Like, just, you know, say whatever you want. I mean, it's, it's not going to make it any less crazy, so... <laughs> Yeah. Yeah. Well, I don't know about you, but I probably don't have too much more to say about this. So do you have any final thoughts to wrap up? Uh, No, do not watch this movie. <laughs> just listen to this podcast. I would say even podcast. if you are a completist, just let it go because it's not it's not really an adaptation. So I'm kind of surprised like and maybe he did and maybe he at this point because, you know, King made such a fuss about Lawnmower Man when it came out, having his name attached to it. I wonder if he ever complains about any of these movies, or maybe he just doesn't care enough because they're just, you know, being thrown direct on video and they don't really affect him in any kind of way, uh, like a theatrical release would. So I don't know. I, I just say avoid it. Yeah, I gave it like a one out of five, which was probably generous. <laughs> yeah. 
one stars are like just nothing works. Like, I mean, there's, you know, it like, there's just, it's like, it, it's barely, it barely functions as a movie. Like this at least functioned as a movie. Like, so it got like that. It got like that extra star from me, I guess. <laughs> like spice world's a one. I'm just, I don't know. <laughs> that was just one that popped in my head. <laughs> yeah. It was just one of those things where I was watching it and it's like, they would show the hallway so many times. And I was like, <laughs> I'm kind of getting bored of this hallway. No offense, people. No kidding. Yeah, no, they didn't have a lot of, they didn't have a lot of sets or they didn't have a lot of space to cover. I, they didn't have a lot of coverage, yeah. I don't think. Excuse so. me, I gave it a one and a half out of five. Oh, nice. <laughs> <laughs> a little better than a one star. Oh, and, and I do, I will say, I like the snow setting. I always enjoy it. Like, I like that isolated because that's like that's like really isolated type of setting for like a horror movie or a sci-fi movie. So I enjoy that. I always that always kind of like piques my interest. Uh, it's not used well in this movie, and this movie could have been set anywhere. I mean, yeah. it wouldn't have mattered. But um, but I think that sometimes that gives me a little bit of a that gives it a little bit of an edge for me. But uh, but yeah, no, it's but it's not good. I mean, regardless of one or two stars, uh, it's not good. So. <laughs> Yeah, it's always fun to just sort of dive into these, though, and be like, what went wrong oh, yeah. here? Because you mentioned King not liking the lawnmower man and having his name taken off of that. And I'm wondering if with this, it was one of those dollar babies and somehow the rights stayed with <laughs> some person long enough yeah, for them to do three of the movies. I have no idea because it doesn't seem like there's any one specific tie to all three movies unless it's a production company and maybe i just didn't catch all of that information yeah i don't know i mean i just kind of assumed that this was dimension films but i actually don't know <laughs> who made this but uh for some reason any of these direct tv uh, direct to video movies like in the late 90s i just always assume it's dimension because they're the ones that made all of the um they've made all the children of the corn sequels uh it was actually trimark though which is about the same. They were Trimark yeah. was pretty big late nineties. Uh, they did like the Leprechaun movies and stuff like that. So that makes perfect sense. Yeah. Well, Jonathan, I think that's mm -hmm. all both of us have to say about this movie. Again, thank you for being willing to come on and discuss it. I know it wasn't exactly the most fun we've had watching a movie, but and it's done and over with now. Getting to talk about movies, I'm I'm never going to complain. So. <laughs> Fair enough. All right, that does it for this episode of Chat Cemetery. You can support the podcast on Patreon for a dollar a month. You'll get a thank you on the show for $2 a month. I will send you a Chat Cemetery sticker. And if you want to follow us on social media, you can do so at Chat Cemetery on Twitter, Instagram, and Facebook. You could also rate and review the show. That's a huge help. And as always, thank you for listening, and we hope you enjoy the rest of your day. Mm -hmm.